Angela, we're on page 73 of our, our book, and uh, you can follow along with us in the book. In the beginning, there was a great surge. You'll learn why that's in all caps as we go through this. Science, Albert Einstein said this, Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. Irritating facts. It was 1916, and Albert Einstein didn't like where his calculations were leading him. If his theory of general relativity was true, it meant that the universe was not eternal, but had a beginning. Einstein's calculations indeed were revealing a definite beginning to all time, all matter, and all space. This flew in the face of his belief that the universe was static, unchanging, and eternal. Einstein later called his discovery irritating. He wanted the universe to be self-existent not reliant on any outside cause, but the universe appeared to be one giant effect. In fact, Einstein so disliked the implication of general relativity, a theory that is now proven accurate to five decimal places, that he introduced a cosmological constant, which some have since called a fudge factor, into his equations in order to show that the universe is static and changing and to avoid an absolute beginning. But Einstein's fudge factor didn't fudge for long. In 1919, British cosmologist Arthur Eddington conducted an experiment during a solar eclipse which confirmed that general relativity, general relativity was indeed true. The universe wasn't static, but had a beginning. Like Einstein, Eddington wasn't happy with the implications. He later wrote philosophically, uh, the notion of a beginning of the present order, the beginning of the universe of nature, is repugnant to me. Repugnant is related to pugnacious. Uh, I should like to find a genuine loophole. In, by 1922, Russian mathematician Alexander Friedman had officially exposed Einstein's fudge factor as an algebraic, algebraic error. Incredibly, uh, in his quest to avoid a beginning, the great Einstein had divided by zero, something even schoolchildren know is a no-no. Meanwhile, Dutch astronomer Wilhelm de Sitter uh, had found that general relativity required the universe to be expanding. And in 1927, the expanding of the universe was actually observed by astronomer Ed Edwin Hubble, namesake for the Space Telescope. Looking through uh, the 100-inch telescope at California's Mount Wilson Observatory, Hubble discovered a red shift in the light from every observable galaxy, which meant that those galaxies were moving away from us. In other words, general relativity was again confirmed. The universe appears to be expanding from a single point in the distant past. In 1929, Einstein made a pilgrimage pilgrimage to Mount Wilson to look through Hubble's telescope for himself. What he saw was irrefutable. It couldn't be refuted, it couldn't be denied. The observational evidence showed that the universe was indeed expanding as general relativity had predicted. With his cosmological constant now completely crushed by the weight of the evidence against it, Einstein could no longer support his wish for an eternal universe. Subsequently described the cosmological constant, constant as the greatest blunder of my life, and he redirected his efforts to find the box top to the puzzle of life. Einstein said he wanted to know God created the world, know, know how God created the world. I am not interested in this or that phenomenon, in the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know his God's thought. The rest are details. Although Einstein said that he believed in a pantheistic God, a God that is the universe, his comments of men in creation and divine thought better describe a theistic God. And as irritating as it may be, his theory of general relativity stands today as one of the strongest lines of evidence for a theistic God. Indeed, general relativity supports what is one of the oldest formal arguments for the existence of a God, the cosmological argument. Don't be put off by the technical sounding name. Cosmological comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. That
That is, the cosmological argument is the argument from the beginning of the universe. If the universe had a beginning, then the universe had a cause. In logical forms, so this is a logical argument. The argument goes like this. One, everything that had a beginning had a cause. Two, the universe had a beginning. Three, therefore, the universe had a cause. As we showed in the last chapter, for an argument to be true, it has to be logically valid, and its premises have to be true. This is a valid argument, but are the premises true? Let's take a look at these premises. Premise one, everything that had a beginning had a cause is the law of causality in science, which is the fundamental principle of science. Without the law of causality, science is impossible. In fact, Francis Bacon, the modern, father of modern science, said true knowledge is true knowledge by causes. In other words, science is a search for causes. That's what scientists do. They try to discover what causes what. If there's one thing we've observed about the universe, it's that things don't happen without a cause. When a man is driving down the street, a car never appears in front of him of his car out of nowhere with no driver or no cause. We know many a police officer has heard this, but it's just not true. There's always a driver or some other cause behind that car appearing. Even the great skeptic David Hume could not deny the law of causality. He wrote, I never asserted so absurd a proposition as that something could arise without a cause. In fact, to deny the law of causality is to deny rationality. The very process of rational thinking requires us to put together thoughts, the causes, that result in the conclusion, the effects. So if anyone ever tells you he doesn't believe in the law of causality, simply ask that person, what caused you to come to that conclusion? Since the law of causality is well established and undeniable, and, and, and un is a well established and undeniable premise. Since the law of causality is well established and undeniable, premise one is true. What about premise two? Did the universe have a beginning? If not, then no point, no cause was needed. If so, then the universe must have had a cause. Now, even scientists accept this. The law of causality, or atheist scientists the law of causality, and that the universe had a beginning. Until the time of Einstein, atheists would, uh, could comfort themselves with the belief that the universe is eternal, and thus did not need a cause. But since then, five lines of scientific evidence have been discovered that prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the universe did indeed have a beginning, and that beginning was what scientists now call the Big Bang. The Big Bang evidence can be easily remembered by the acronym CERT. So we'll pick up there uh, next time. But uh, for now, uh, I want to uh, turn to in your little atheist book to any questions or chapters. We may not get through this, but that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll do what we can. So when you look at God's creation, what comes to mind? When you look at something like the sunsets recently with the haze and the smoke that's in the air and how bright red that makes them. Last night, the, the moon had this orangey tint because of it. Yes? Oh, that's chapter four. Thank you. Still a good question. Um, what would you say to someone who asked you why you believe God exists? And we will we will talk about that. The reliability of extra What else? And the Bible tells us there's a God, right? Okay. What else?
and how could they have accidentally arrived? Spontaneous. What caused all of that? I think the times, I think of the times, one time we went out to the lake, uh, out to a dark, it's not so dark now, a dark uh, road near the lake, near our lake cabin, uh, on a night when there were really And you could just see night sky and all the stars it gives you a sense of your own smallness but also a sense of the hugeness. What do you uh, suppose Albert Einstein meant when he said science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind? Yeah, they go hand in hand. By lame, I don't think he means the way recent generations are capable of existing. Science without religion, and then religion without science is, is blind. Right? We're going to believe things just because someone tells us with no proof behind it. There are a lot of people who, who do um, either believe something other than the Bible with no proof behind it, or they believe but they don't know why. And that's being blind. It's blind faith. So, why is it important for Christianity to be built on reason and faith? Why, why you know, reason and faith? Um, why can't we just have faith and not know the reason why? Yeah. I mean, this isn't Santa Claus or your tooth fairy. They're real implications, right? And and I I would think that anyone who's had um, an inkling that there's a God. I think there's no more important question than to figure out who is that guy and what do I know about it and what do I really need to know. To just say, yeah, there's a God and not care, that makes, that makes zero sense to me. Because if there's a God who created us, we belong to him. You guys haven't had kids yet. But someday I hope you will. Because it's wonderful. Uh, but sometimes they look at you and uh, say things that you can't believe are coming out of their mouth. Like, no. Uh, or why? Uh, and in, in those moments, you say, Mom, I not only gave birth to you, but I clothed you and fed you and taken care of you, and now you're looking at me with why? Uh, and that's why because I said so is actually a very so I know you don't think it is, but someday you'll say If there's a God, we belong to him. And I'll be not want to know more about that. So yeah, I have my own Okay, so we'll stop there uh, and we'll um, begin working on these quick questions. I'll also um, talk through the Angela, 